Okay. The Zoom goddess. <laughs> mm. Oh, everybody. Summertime. Good time looking through, just see who else is here with us today. It's wonderful to see you all. Yay. Oh, hey. <laughs> it's a good feeling to connect with you all. Thank you. Okay, well, Darine, as you're ready, take it away. <laughs> Hola, everyone. It's lovely to be in front of you all. <laughs> Super sweet. Hello. Great. So, um, just to start taking your time to come into a posture that is balanced, has some energy, it's relaxed. And if taking a few deep breaths all the way down to your belly, if that is helpful for you to arrive, land in your body. And perhaps you start just receiving sounds, external sounds, sounds inside of our body. Receiving sound vibration. Just as it's happening. Letting them come and go, whether they are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral.
Perhaps we notice there is a name. Describe, describing the sound or a mental picture. No problem. We just notice that that's just a concept. Appreciating that. Perhaps feeling the sensations, physical sensations in the hand. It's more available or obvious to you. And again, just receiving perhaps temperature, warm, cool, more tingly, movement. Heavy, light, wherever it feels most obvious, relaxing a little bit more. Nothing to do but just receive, connect. With what is happening right now. Perhaps there is some interest in our experience, not knowing mind. Curious. We can open up the attention at times and receive the physical sensations throughout the body. Pleasant sensations, unpleasant or neutral. And remembering that we can always call up loving kindness, and 
and compassion. with whatever is arising. And perhaps appreciating the breath the body the senses watching the river of life, the movement of every moment coming and going by itself. Emotions. Checking the correspondence of the motion in the body. Perhaps connecting with the movement of the breath, feeling directly the sensations as the belly rises. And as it falls down, Just this moment, with much care as we can. Alert. Relax.
Thank you, Darine. Thank you, Michelle, for that vigorous bell ringing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there were two themes that I wanted to speak on today, and I'm not sure how well I'll be able to <clears throat> bridge them, um, how coherent that'll be, but First, it has to do with um, a question that came up last, I think it was last weekend, I think it was um, last Sunday, or the weekend before, or maybe it was last year, it all still feels a little blurry uh, these days. But when Harry was talking about, and I won't even try to kind of quote directly, but the sense of experience not being as sort of fulfilling, um, and that dance between and that, that sort of vacillation that can happen in our hearts between where that feels um, like it can be a relief of disenchantment with experience that, that the heart mind stops expecting satisfaction out of um, pleasant experience or experiences that we're looking forward to. And there's a relief in that because in fact, experience can't provide satisfaction in a stable and consistent way. And so where is that sort of disenchantment? Something that feels very liberating and easeful. And when does it feel destabilizing and um, disheartening or depressing? that we feel perhaps we don't have access to the same degree of kind of joy and enthusiasm around some of life's experience. It's a very important aspect of this practice and this path. And so I just, I wanted to kind of go into it a little bit. And, and then the, the related piece has to do with, I, I do get the sense for myself and others that I talk with that this is also something perhaps on a broader scale that's happening for many as we move a little bit out of the seclusion of um, social distancing and the COVID um, this, this past year in particular of, of more restrictions around social interaction. And as people are moving into back into gatherings or, you know, physical contact or face-to-face -face kind of experiences, the places where that's sort of scary or where people are excited to, and then it turns out to be sort of not as fulfilling as they expected or um, kind of over exuberant uh, in ways that people aren't necessarily prepared for or don't feel prepared for. And just that it's, a, it's an important thing. And, and I think, especially for yogis, something that people may be going through in terms of a sensitivity to, to coming out of what has been a real kind of actually a protection. I think it's often been framed as a, an, a, a kind of enforcement of social boundaries in a sort of negative way, but you can see how, how much it actually resembles the renunciation of monastics um, in our own tradition in a, in a very, very kind of these very palpable ways. I, I was outside of the grocery store yesterday and these two friends who hadn't seen each other in a while saw each other and there had to be sort of like five minutes of sort of like consent before this sense of like, can we hug, <laughs> you know? And and what a powerful sort of like process it was to kind of watch and, and they hugged and, and then, you know, they chatted a little bit and left and one saying, you know, thank you for the hug. It was something that may have been so, um, unconsidered, you know, a year and a half ago, now is something that's so powerful and really beautiful, and yet, of course, loaded, right? And so this sense of looking at our tradition, and I think about that with our monks and nuns, and how little physical contact they have with 
one another, with lay people in general. Um, and, and most of it tends to be very kind of practical if, if there is. Um, the nuns are in Burma that I'm familiar with tend to be a little more warm with their sort of, with each other in terms of their physical contact. Um, uh, but it's, it's still understood that there's a, a restraint there that has this value of um, protection and, and carefulness where, the, again, going back to this theme of our, where are experiences perhaps less satisfying than we expected them to be? And then where other experiences perhaps lead to more kind of clinging and craving and desire and um, things that feel sort of un unwholesome in a different way in our own hearts. There are a few things about the Vipassana practice and the, the method and tradition that we're a part of that I think are so helpful around some pieces of some of these understandings in particular. So when it comes to the sense of um, even just the idea that the word disillusioned or the word disenchanted in English or in the English speaking cultures has a sort of negative context, a connotation, right? It's like, oh, disillusionment is like a, a bummer, you know, uh, disenchantment is seen as a, has a sort of negative unpleasant quality. And, and there's something um, so opposite in terms of our tradition of how they're held, right? The sense of losing illusion <laughs> and losing enchantment, right? Which is to say this, this sense that we are enchanted, we're, we are seeing things unclearly, right? We're not seeing things as they truly are. And so we're enamored with experience in a way um, that is not based in reality. That's not based on our direct experience. And so when this disenchantment happens, when we start seeing that, you know, that, that actually experience can be pleasant but that it isn't dependably pleasant over time, that it isn't dependably able to provide satisfaction over time, right? That the, the pleasant quality of it dissipates or other conditions of our mind dissipate, whatever it might be. And so it's like, where, how do we bear the instability of the insight also? So that there's a point where it's like, oh, the mind can be relieved because it's stopping grasping, it's stopping clinging. There's a settledness, there's a soberness to our relationship with reality, with the relationship with the future of the sense of like, oh, like we don't need to be kind of like leaning in and, and kind of falling into the next moment and trying to conjure up more of who we wanna be and what we want for ourselves and how we want things to be in even 20 seconds away, never mind five years away or 10 years away. This relief of like, oh, of the sober, soberness of disenchantment, of a, and of the equanimity that has to be there for that to arise, right? The sense of contentment and, and peacefulness with things as they are, even if they're not pleasant, this ability for the heart to feel contented, to feel peaceful, to feel unstrained and unrelaxed, uh, un uh, not restless um, with the fact of the way things are. But of course, that, that moment can be, is also fleeting. <laughs> the mind is, we are in a process of training, you know, for this. And so that stability and equipoise of acceptance of things as they are, of the heart not clinging to things, of not needing things to be one way or another, that will generally not last either that 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 spaciousness is there also due to conditions and so um you know until we have fully uprooted these um uh, qualities of the heart that lean towards confusion and, and anger and uh craving the conditions of the mind will change and and you can start to see this sort of cloud of kind of despondency arise with the unsatisfactory of things, right? Or a depression or a kind of um, dullness that doesn't feel alive, that doesn't really feel peaceful. 
and the truth of how careful we have to be with our view, right? With the understanding that our perception and our perspective is also not clear, not, not um, purely seeing most of the time, that it is also part of this cloud of experience and that we will often take insight and undermine it. The mind will undermine it. The mind will try to fold the reality back into its perspective on things, its, uh, its views, its kind of habitual patterns of uh, analysis and understanding who we are. And it's a very powerful trap that can happen to all of us and does happen to all of us. That is, um, it can be very compelling whether it's a sort of negative view of ourselves or a negative view of the world or kind of this sort of despondency that can happen um, when we see the unsatisfaction, unsatisfactory quality of things and how vigilant we have to keep being with the mind and being willing to see that we can't trust the mind, right? That so much of the time we cannot trust the mind, the perspective of the mind, that, that we need to get a perspective on our perspective and how hard that is because um, the, the mind is so trained to fold everything back into its habitual perspective. And yet how necessary it is. So part of the practice of like seeing the momentary nature of, of peacefulness and then depressiveness, you know, or joy or, you know, hopelessness or, or whatever. It's like just getting this sense of the momentary quality of experience and of, and of nature and not feeling, not getting drowned in doubt when the peacefulness doesn't last, right? Or when the um, sort of shadow qualities of these insights can arise. Because many of the insights in the classic sense of our tradition are not pleasant. You know, the, there are some insights that are often experienced in a very pleasant way, right? These being, the mind is cultivated and, and the attention is cultivated, the concentration, mindfulness in certain ways where things are seen very clearly and the mind feels very stable and very strong and very joyful or very peaceful. And that's really wonderful. And even those, because the, of the instability can lead to these corruptions of insight, the sense of like, oh, I'm enlightened. Oh, I've done it. Oh, I'm better. I'm the best yogi here, or whatever, right? These like inflated senses that can happen to the mind based on like a few moments of what we might consider quote unquote good practice. And then there are many insights that are not pleasant, you know, insight into dukkha, insight into the uh, dis disillusion of phenomena, right? This, when you're, the mind is very, very able to really be so precise with what's happening. There's times where that's like amazing and times where everything can feel like it's just collapsing around us and it's terrifying, right? And, and the mind gets scared or the mind is, realizes how, how terrifying it is to cling to things, right? And there's a, there's a fear of its own tendencies to do things. So this sense of like, oh yeah, even insight isn't necessarily always going to be pleasant. And so how do we take the possibility that insight might itself might not be into a pleasant experience and the, it, the quality itself might not be pleasant, but that doesn't make it not valid. It doesn't lead us into doubt. And so again, it's, it's like this part of how we get a little bit of sense of objective perspective on what's happening is just through this mental noting. And it's something that, you know, we teach you know, many people have practiced for many years. Many people get kind of tired of it. It feels rote or mundane. Um, you think you just want to be in the present moment with experiences and adding a label to it can feel like, oh, you're slowing things down and it feels manipulative, right? But there's another version where it's when you see when the mind is really caught up in this sort of uh, perspective, you know, a negative perspective or a delusional positive perspective <laughs> on things, um, how important it is to be able to just go to like, oh, pressure, tightness, tension, tension, unpleasant, not wanting, a thought arises, thinking, worrying, planning, catastrophizing, 
longing, wanting, warmth, coolness, pressure, motion, intention to reach, intention to reach, grasping, grasping, cling, you know, like this sense of breaking the experience down into things that can simply be named, not in terms of our analysis of how well things are going for us or what's happening in the world or what's happening with our lives, et cetera. It's the sense of like being able to just break out of that a little bit and understanding at times the degree to which we just cannot trust the mind. We cannot trust the mind's perspective because it's, it'll, it will do everything it can to fold reality back into its perception of reality, which is a different planet altogether. And so the, the, the mental noting process, the labeling process is, is this incredible, it's like so simple in such a powerful way to get a little bit of breathing room. And it's not just while we're doing our formal meditation practice, but like in our lives, the sense of when you start to feel overwhelmed, when you start to see that the mind is kind of beginning to spin around certain patterns that it spins at, right? It's like, where do you just notice? Oh, sitting, sitting, hardness, pressure, tingling, tension, warmth, coolness, motion, stillness, physical, you know, the, the physicality of what's happening. Then there's the mental, emotional experience. Oh, in terms of feeling tone, right? Pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. Oh, pleasant, unpleasant, unpleasant, unpleasant. And you can start to see, oh, the mind is sort of spinning around unpleasant sensations, you know? And you watch just that closely, you see, oh, Maybe the unpleasantness isn't this brick wall that we feel like it is. Actually, in a momentary way, if you really break down our experience, there's like a lot of pleasant experiences intermixed with unpleasant or neutral experiences. And it starts to break up the solidity of our viewpoint, of our perspective on what's happening in the moment, how important that is. How important it is to have that tool of just like, okay, getting a little bit of distance, getting a little perspective on our perspective. What a relief it can bring, how simple it is. I think we can feel that it's, it's, it's easy to get into a, the idea that Vipassana meditation practice is supposed to create a relationship to life that is just always just enthralled and engrossed and just like captivated kind of enraptured experience with everything that's happening you know and it's like we're just constantly like oh, 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 like scintillating with all of the you know arising and passing of course like there are, there are qualities of experience of rapture and stuff like that that can happen also can be that range of incredibly pleasant to incredibly unpleasant, right? That sort of enthrallment and engrossment with experience. And it's considered a big danger to get stuck there, right? To get too fixated on the, the pleasant or unpleasant quality of it, the weirdness of it, the strangeness of it. And actually it's like just going back to the simplicity of the object, the simplicity of the object, retraining the attention on just the, the basics. That's what helps us kind of break through into the next qualities of tranquility that are available to us. And also break through out of that pleasure pain syndrome, right? That we're not so fixated on if something's pleasant the habitual response or something is unpleasant, the habitual response. It's like, oh, being able to kind of break out of that with this mind training of, of where to bring the attention to, where not to get so engrossed and enamored and enchanted with our habitual perspectives on things, how important that is, how hard it is, how really hard it is. And, and that's why it's like, okay, right, going back, anchoring into the body, labeling, you know, mental noting, this such this basic, pure, beautiful practice that helps us, you know, you can say, you know, it's hard to argue about objective perspective at this day and age, right? But, but it's, it's as close as you can get to that, right? Or a process that develops that sense of like trying to be very, getting out of the filter of how we're interpreting everything into the basic reality of, of how it is. Again, not just in our formal practice, but in just our daily lives. Walking, walking, seeing, seeing, want, wanting, not wanting, uh, 
you know, fabricating, conjuring, proliferating, you know, watching things build, watching things dissipate. These are basic qualities in the uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, right? Knowing the, when the breath is long, knowing the breath is long. When the breath is short, knowing the breath is short. When they're sitting, knowing or sitting. When there's lying, knowing or lying. When there's unwholesome activity in the heart and mind, knowing it, understanding what led to it, understanding what might lead to uh, uh, the abandoning of it, right? The letting go of it. And so this is uh, a little bit of like another tricky place of where do we simply respond in a kind of dialectical way to what's happening? Oh, I see this pattern. And so, and I think it's wrong. I think it's a negative pattern. And so I'm gonna do the opposite. And the challenges of that and the, the, the subtleties of where that can be sometimes helpful and sometimes very uh, detrimental because we see the pattern we can see the pattern in our behavior internally, externally, and we can recognize it as unskillful. And there can be a sense of like, oh, okay, that there's a, a clean and clear understanding of, oh, we've caused harm or there's something um, unskillful in that. What led to that arising? What can I do to change that, right? To, to not do this again can come from a very wholesome place, whether even for internal things, like how we sometimes talk about the seven factors of awakening or the hindrances, like, oh, there's sleepiness. Okay, can we cultivate a little energy? There's over energy. Can we cultivate a little bit of calmness? This, again, the sort of dialectical, like, oh, you're, one thing happens, it's out of balance, so you're bringing in the kind of opposite thing. But what we also see is the motivation isn't always clear seeing, right? It's not just, oh, I recognize this is unskillful and so I shouldn't do it. Sometimes, oh, there's guilt, there's shame and there's unpleasantness to that shame and we have aversion to the shame. And so we don't no longer wanna do the thing. And you can see how like, it might look like this bad, it's something I've done something unskillful and it ends at, I need, I wanna do something different. But the process getting there was actually totally different. And it means that the, the actual result of that is gonna be very different. The action is gonna be multi motivated by aversion, aversion to shame, right? Or that's just one example versus clear seeing of unskillfulness. And so then if we're trying to not do something or change something about ourselves, what's hard is you start to see that we're trying to change it from within the same perspective, right? That you you get a sense of a pattern that's unwholesome or unhealthy in the mind. But then your attempt at changing it, you think is outside of that pattern, but it's still in the pattern, <laughs> right? And that's very difficult to see, very difficult to negotiate. But the, what's, so, what's so helpful about the practice is it's not trying to even manipulate that. There's a sense of like, oh, can we just see it? <laughs> can we, rather than saying, oh, well, then don't do it because it's motivated by aversion and because you're averse to aversion to the aversion to the thing. It's just like, wow, like you just notice, oh, you try to be more careful. You see, there was an action. There was a recognition. There was shame. There was aversion to shame. There was a, an inability to be with that delusion arose, da, 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 and then there was this action. It's like, oh, being able to watch that cycle is very important. So being able to watch sleepiness is important, right? It's like, if we're trying to bring energy because we're aversive to sleepiness, that's actually trying to fix it from within the pattern. It's not actually outside of the pattern. If we see that there's a lot of energy and a lot of excitement, and we're trying to change it because we have decided you don't like the feeling of that energy. It feels like it's too intense for the body and we're doing it out of aversion. Then it's like, again, we think we're trying to come to balance because we've seen the pattern, but we're actually operating within the pattern. And so then there's the part of just that pure mindfulness and the equanimity cultivation of where can I be okay with lots of energy, with restlessness? Where can I be okay with anger? Or can I be okay with wanting? And we try to break out of seeing that like, it's not always just about this dialectical response internally. It's about trying to understand and that the wisdom itself, the understanding is the mechanism for the deeper insight, the deeper transformation, the deeper change, not the manipulation. 
and sometimes we manipulate. So there's this, it's like, it's not to say that we then never manipulate. You never try to adjust or you never tinker or you never do these things. It's like, it's not, it's not a formula, but, but it's important to recognize, oh, there's the places where there are the adjustments and then there's a trying to control the conditions to some degree of our lives or our meditation practice or our concentration or what have you. And then there's the place of seeing, oh, well, it's not just about creating perfect conditions. It's about creating the supportive conditions to the degree we can to have insight so that we're able to have that natural fluidity and acceptance and peacefulness no matter what happens. You know, you'll see a lot of times we say, it's like, oh, if things are overwhelming in your practice, you know, go, you know, move away from the intense object, the, the physical pain that might be too much for the attention to bear. Can you bring it, the attention somewhere else in your practice? So there's a manipulative quality to that. Or um, do maybe practice a little compassion, a little bit of love and kindness, the sense of you're trying to uh, find a balance in relationship to what's happening. Or when you're on retreat as yogis, the sense of, you know, we have a lot of permission and encouragement to like, go take a walk. Or, you know, if things are really overwhelming, don't practice, you know, go outside, see some flowers, you get like, bring in some beauty, you know? So the sense of like, we're not always insisting that you're just like, you're just with whatever's happening because we recognize that sometimes the mind heart isn't capable of being what's happening, being with what's happening in a way that is, uh, genuinely interested and that's genuinely capable of connecting with it without um, without the instability being overly triggering right and so there's this dance of where do we kind of where where when is the mind capable of being with the instability that's so hard, you know, it's so hard to be with the instability of things and the unsatisfactoriness of things and the undependability of things and where is it capable and how powerful it is to be able to observe that and how hard it is. But also the places where the mind isn't capable of it, right? And you see the pain and the difficulty of running from the instability of things, from den denying the instability, from fighting the instability. And yet we're not trying to change the nature of things but we're trying to slowly build up the heart and mind's capacity to be with the truth of things as they are. And sometimes that requires uh, manipulation, sometimes it requires acceptance and, and uh, non-manipulation, um, but to give ourselves that sort of sense of permission, but to be very um, a healthy level of skepticism about our perspective of what's happening, you know? Um, it's just so important. And I don't, now that I've gone down that thread, I, I don't know really about how to kind of connect it to the, the other part of our coming out of, um, uh, you know, quarantine and social engagement and social interaction, except for that it's like a similar thing, that it's, that there's places where we might appreciate the the restraint that we've had, where we get that the seclusion has been a very powerful protection, even if it has put us up against our sadness and our grief about not being able to connect, even if it's put us up against the, the wanting to give someone a hug or, or giving someone a hug and you feel like you shouldn't have, and then you just feel like you've done some like horrible thing, right? Because like you didn't have a mask on, you gave someone a hug and now like, you know, everyone's gonna die around you, right? It's like the, the, the sense of like totally catastrophizing, you know, these, what would have a year and a half ago have been kind of in, unconsidered um, experiences, uh, interactions that there is this process of like really understanding that we still have some choice, you know, and that is going to be perhaps less socially 
supported, right? Our continued seclusion in whatever ways is not gonna have as much sort of social validity, you know, or there's the sort of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask and suddenly, so, you know, that becomes like more intense in terms of things, but there's like the internal mask as well. There's the like physical hygiene and there's the spiritual hygiene and the sense of like, what is it to be starting to go into, you know, more contact with people? And where are the places where that's like really uplifting and really supportive and feels like so good to be able to just like have a cup of coffee with someone outdoors in a way that you haven't been able to do in so long, you know? And then where is it like, you're at a barbecue and there's 50 people and it, you don't even remember ever having 50 people around you at once, you know? And it's just like, you leave and you're like, like you've just sort of had your finger on the electric socket or something, you know? Um, where is that place? And, and to be very careful about the mental interpretation of how the pleasant or unpleasant quality that arises from that, right? The sense of like, I never want to see anyone again, or I never want to be alone again, or whatever, the sense of like our interpretation of the experience, just to be very careful about believing it, right? About feeling like we've created a view that now fits the world and fits ourselves and, and trust that the mind of course is gonna keep trying to do that. There's a, there's a the CIA have this, these like um, 10 rules about like, uh, if you're really in like enemy territory, you know, the Moscow rules that are called supposedly, right? And one of them, is never underestimate a human being's ability to rationalize the truth. And this sense of like, there's, it's very insightful, right? Of just like the mind is going to take whatever happens, whatever experience and try so hard to fold it back in its own understanding of how things are or should be or the way we want them to be or the way we think they are. And um, that's, understandable, right? That is how the mind is creating safety. It's like you have to get that without the perfect equanimity and the perfect mindfulness and perfect concentration, the mind finds stability in views and in the kind of propagation and, and constantly shoring these things up. And so you have to have a little patience with the mind that's gonna do this, that's gonna catastrophize or overvalorize or whatever. But at the same time, it's like, okay, where do you have some perspective on the perspective of like, okay, okay, there's just overwhelm right now. There's just a lot of energy right now. There's all these thoughts, all these things I just heard are going around my head for the few hours and there's enjoying it or there's not enjoying it. And again, it's like that basic practice of just like mental noting <laughs> and how simple it is and how pure it is and how clear it is of just like, oh, pressure, wanting, overwhelm, excitement, frustration, anger, whatever, and, and getting that like, yeah, this, it can happen, all of that can happen in quick succession, very, you know, at any given moment. And so it takes some work of getting, getting the mindfulness going and keeping it maintained. As you start to let some of these protections of seclusion down, there are going to be consequences if for the mind. And we just have to know that we're we are the owners of our actions, right? That we are gonna bear the experience internally of whatever we decide to do. And it's beautiful and it's actually beautiful practice to be able to do and to not only live in seclusion, but to, to recognize that it's like, okay, this is of course what starts to happen. And um, to be gentle with ourselves, to be patient with ourselves and also to be vigilant, you know, as much as possible with, with the way the mind tends to be interpreting uh, what happens in those ways. So I'll end there uh, for now. And um, we do have some time for questions. If you have any about your practice, about um, anything I've offered, about Darine's instructions, you can click on the little reactions button at the bottom there of your Zoom screen. And there should be a little um, raise your hand. Yes, button there. And you can raise your hand and we'll know you have a question. Um, if that doesn't seem to be working, feel free to type something into the chat and we'll just say you have a question and we'll call on you.
Quinn. I think you can unmute yourself. I think I set it to that. Can you do that now? Yeah. Unmute. Um, in regard to your statement about never underestimate the mind to justify or rationalize whatever the mind believes in. I remember um, John Singer Sargent, a water colorist who did a portrait of a lady and she complained that the nose is too long. And he said, Doesn't, don't worry, tomorrow your nose will be longer. So the mind can always rationalize whatever it believes in, right? And um, today your topic just to the point with my problem. Uh, I have negative moments when there's physical pain or there's mental pain, a lot of aversion, the shame. And when I can accept that that's what's happening, uh, then I, I feel that I'm liberated and there's joy in it. But today, uh, well, lately, I think, I feel that I'm at the pith that everything is so depressing and um, I don't even want to get out of that depression that I'm afraid that, okay, maybe I have moment of freedom, but it will go away. I don't, I don't even want that. So how do I deal with it? That is, that's so great. Darina, do you want me to start or do you have something? To, yeah. I mean, I think that that it's it's so powerful, and and just that is so important to recognize that you see the aversion or the sadness as as a protection, as a safety against the undependability yes. of things. And I and just need that protection. Yes. Yeah, and it's un, it's incredible because I think we tend to think of like, oh, it's just the greed, you know, our it's the pleasant it's like trying to create pleasant experiences are going to, is going to keep the unpleasant at bay. We can, that's like a logical thing for us, right? We can see how there's a mental tendency to do that, but it is much, it's, le, it's more counterintuitive for some reason to, un, to see that the ways that the mind uses negative emotions also for the same reason, that the, there, why does the depression feel safe? And to understand that that's very powerful, that that actually the the mind there's a there's maybe a sort of softness to it, there's a dullness to it. Starting to appreciate why does the mind consider this sadness or this depression, this kind of even mild depressiveness, as a place of safety, and not why does it do it as like an interrogation, but why does it do it as like genuine interest and and just having to recognize that of like oh right. There's something here, as, as horrible as it feels, still feels safer than reality. That's just like crazy and undependable and always changing out of our control. And so I just think there's something to just to like, yeah, keep going with that, really going. It's like seeing that it's like, oh yeah, all of these things that we think are the problem. Oh, if only I wasn't like this, if only I could just accept it, if only, versus seeing like, no, these are the mind, part of the mind's way of protecting itself. And it must be doing something for us. The, the solidity of self-view of like, oh, I can't do this, or the solidity of the worldview, it's hopeless, and therefore, whatever. It's like, it's that solidity that makes us feel safe, even if it's a negative solidity, and how incredible that is. And, and so I think just, yeah, like what you're doing, it's like, you don't have to fight it. Don't feel like, oh, I shouldn't go to this. I should be just accepting things as they are because you know that when that happens I'm joyful and it feels better and it feels easeful it's like understand like why oh what are the conditions that led the mind to find this as safety versus mindfulness and maybe it's just like 
tiredness, right? Maybe you have like a lot going on <laughs> or whatever, you know, like these things that aren't really that personal are usually the, a lot of the, the reality of what it is. And to just see that it's like, oh, uh, a little bit of meta for the heart, right? For the mind, a little bit of compassion of just being like, oh yeah, there's a, this feels safer and as terrible as it is, you know, and how disorienting it is, but also very liberating, right? And, and not beating up the mind for yeah. for finding its safety in these sort of funny ways. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Daddy, you want to add anything to that one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Hey, everyone. Um, I think I really relate to what Quinn is saying. Um, and at the same time, I sometimes recently finding a joy of grasping and joy of just distracting. I was like, oh, wow, I got distracted again. It's, it's awesome how many times I get distracted and resistance and um, how much energy like behind it. Like there, there's so much energy to resist something and like, wow, like that's, that's awesome sometimes. And what you were talking about with being alone and being with somebody and in New York, it's really opening up and um, my job is coming back in the fall and um, just preparing for it. It's, and because I was alone, I felt really safe and since like for two years I've been transitioning as a transgender person and it's it's just a engaging to like outside world seems so dangerous to me and there there was a point that there was a point that everything seems so like all the perspective I had was like shattered and I didn't know what to, how to relate to outside world. Um, then I really, that's when I actually started to appreciate distraction because I really felt like I needed it and I couldn't do it without it. And there's like my a little worry about, oh, am I, Am I keep appreciating this distraction? Is this, this like, is it gonna be like kind of unskillful thing? Like I, I there's a like hint of worry. Um, I just um, wanted to ask somebody about the worry. <laughs> that in it? Do you want to start? Do you want to? No? Me? <laughs> ah, I think you can unmute. Oh, oh I have to make you a host. There. I yeah. think I can, yeah. I'll try. Um, I think what I keep hearing uh, is that you have a, a great relationship instead of beating yourself up. It, it, Two times you mentioned that you are like you didn't say celebrating but um, appreciating the distraction and I think that in itself is super healthy um, to appreciate it and uh, thank thank it um, and about the worry um, I think just to relate to, um, I don't know how to, um, I have to think about that one. I have it, but I, not in words yet. Um, you know, we, 
the, the war is projecting that this is gonna be forever a relationship to, to destruction. And of course it's going to change. And it's, um, and now it's like a, the new object is warring and you can relate the same way to, the same way you are relating to destruction, relate to worry. It's the new, um, the new object. And that's, that's what I will, uh, I'm thinking of. Um, maybe I come back. <laughs> yeah, no, I, right. I mean, I think there is that level of like, kind of like what I was saying in my talk, it's like, you think the worrying is outside of the perspective of the distraction, right? That like, it's like, oh, I'm worried about this thing. And so that you've kind of bounced out of it, but really that the worrying can be part of the same patterning also is just important to see, right? That it's like, oh no, you just notice the worrying and you notice this. I think, yeah, there's always, there's always, especially when you come to sort of like the, the formal baseline of our tradition and like, you know, how kind of stringent and strict a lot of the sort of guidelines that we've inherited as yogis are around distraction or around these things. And so sometimes it can be, it feels like from within parts of the tradition, you don't have as much sort of support for the sense of like, oh, appreciating the hindrances <laughs> or something, right? Uh, for sure. So I think that part of what can be helpful is like just that recognition, the, the, the intention to sort of see where, what is skillful and what is not and what can create harm and what might not be creating harm, right? And this, th that, that ultimately is going to be a, a, an important um, way of determining whether it starts to feel like, oh, there's a, a new pattern building where it's like actually creating harm or, or not. And it might not always be clear. I think it's a good thing to be kind of careful of, but I also think that it's like, to be very careful about, it's like, just like Darian is saying, just notice the, notice the worrying, <laughs> notice, notice the doubt, notice the, the, the guilt or whatever it is that might be arising that you think is clear seeing. You think that's the voice of like the Sayadaw saying like, don't let yourself be distracted. But maybe it's really the voice of just like guilt and shame around like being a human. And th that is actually not the, you know, like there's also strong admonition against shame, against un unnecessary cultivation of, you know, worthlessness and, and those things. So it's like very careful with, with believing the worrying or believing the doubt, but you notice it, right? It's like, okay, you noted that. And then what happens? And then what? And then what? And then what? Um, and, and just in particular, I think just, you said very beautifully this, like to go through this transition of being more public as a transgender person in this period of where there's been so much seclusion and I don't know how that has been for you, if that has helped make it feel like there was a safety in it, that you could kind of mitigate how open or narrow that publicness of it was, is an incredible thing about this time. And that you're ent going to be entering a time where you have less control over that, just for employment and all these other reasons. I just, you know, I, I, I totally feel like that is a, a very like visceral and understandable, you know, very reasonable concern. And so just to be, you know, it's like the same lessons ultimately. It's like, where can you be as careful as possible? Where, when you do go out and are sort of more exposed, where do you then give yourself as much time to kind of be secluded, be protected? And this, this thing that on some level, of course, we've all learned to do a, for different degrees of vulnerability as, private as public as internal and ex as external also as a performer you know that you've had to negotiate some of these things in your life already and and understand how hard they are ultimately it's like the same tools the same process same lessons but of course there's a, something so um, tender at the heart of it that you'll just want to be as protective as you can and as careful as you can and create whether it's like internally or just in with your partner or other friends or where do you where do you build up the the stable 
that you can come back to, even if it's a constructed stable, of course it is, right? Or the distraction or the sense of like, oh, I need a break from this or whatever. Again, it's like, it's like, where are you making the mind feel safe enough so that it can explore, so that it can open up, right? And that is ultimately the difference of like, where are you letting yourself be distracted in a conscious way because you understand that it's skillful and where are you doing it because it's a habit that we can't, because we can't bear whatever the reality is. And so of course we have, we all have all of those layers, the parts that are more conscious and the parts that are less conscious. And it's like bringing more of it into the conscious realm and not demonizing it, but understanding that, oh, and then maybe there's ways where we can, instead of doing this thing, which has unhealthy qualities, we can supplant some of that structure, you know, um, in other ways in our lives to help us feel safe and, and solid when we need to, and we feel overexposed or threatened, you know, yeah. It's great. Hmm. I did see there's a, a question here from Victor that I wanted to just address about like, when is it beneficial to just feel the sadness and depression is the most common stance to watch it. And I, I think it's important to just say, um, it's one of these, it, it, again, it's it's part it, part of this dynamic. If let's just say depressiveness is a, a part of our s systemic, our system's response to the overwhelm in, in life and to just reality, right? So some people are going to have addiction, some people are going to have depression, some people have addiction and depression. So we're all going to have whatever we have. But it's like if you see that that sort of like whirlpool vortex of depression, right, in a very powerful way is part of your heart's response to creating stability and safety. We have to be very careful about exactly kind of what I was saying. Oh, you see the pattern. And so you say, I'm going to go into it. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to learn from it without realizing that that impulse is actually from within the pattern. That is not an impulse that's actually outside of the pattern. And so what's hardest so much of the time for us is that saying like, no, I'm actually not going to move into it. I'm actually not going to go into the black hole. I'm actually going to go and stabilize and, you know, look, have something pleasant, create a little bit more sort of like uh, neutral experience or pleasant experience because we see that it's so seductive the feeling of like we're going to examine it, but that we, are, we don't usually have the mindfulness that's strong enough to actually observe it, that instead of observing it, we just slip into it and we build into it and we sort of fall into that cocoon of it. And so again, it's where that mental noting and the sort of discipline of, of manipulation actually, right? Where it's like, no, you're not going to just go where the attention naturally is called. You're going to have some discipline with like, I get, I, I, you have enough experience knowing that the mind actually can't safely go there. And so you, you create buoyancy of the mind, you create stability, you create neutrality, you perhaps investigate less. And there's the, the sense of like, when perhaps there is a lot of stability and this thing arises, you note it. It's not like I'm gonna go in and feel all of it. It's like, oh, sadness. Oh, a pull, wanting, feeling, feeling you know, pulled into it, feeling drawn to it. Oh, feeling drawn, feeling drawn hopelessness, whatever, and then moving back out, right? You sort of do like um, small, small, small doses um, that you can manage. Um, and that there's never this belief that like the solution is going to come once you are able to just dive in there and be totally mindful of the, you know, the black hole. It's like, no, it's like the universe has black holes, it has stars, it has planets, it has all this dust. It's like every place has its place and and you're not trying to get rid of it. As long as you think that the work is trying to get rid of that, you're caught in the same perspective, the same dynamic. It's like only when there's a sense of like, oh, it's there. You notice it, there's some compassion. You notice a thought, you notice pressure in your foot. It's, it's you have perspective on your perspective that it is happening as well as lights, darkness, color, movement, whatever, or, you know, all of these other things, and that it has its sort of place in the cosmos of your being, then you have a sense of like, oh, it's safe to explore, you know.
sorry, I know that was like very long winded, but it felt like it's, it's not, it's not a easy thing to just sort of say very um, uh, succinctly. I guess maybe, and I don't know, Dardine, if you have anything you want to say about that thing around, you know, depression or whatever, but it's like the opposite is true. Say it's addiction, right? Say there's a pleasant sensation that you know you're like totally compelled by and you don't have a lot of grounding with. It's like, you just think of it. It's like, what would the opposite be? It's like, all oh, right, you really kind of try to keep your distance. You're trying to be careful of it. You don't get pulled into the vortex of it until you feel like a really lot of stability in the mind. And then you just, it's like, you notice it a little bit along with everything else. Hmm. Well, if that's all folks have for today, I wish you well. I think we're all very aware of just what an interesting transition time we're in right now. And just, yeah, we hope you take care of yourselves and take care of each other and have that sense of protection and expansion. And, you know, again, there's the, the good part of it is that ability to feel these Brahma Viharas, you know, with one another and metta and connection and generosity and that, that sense of, of goodwill and all the beauty of human interaction. So I hope you feel some of that goodness as well and take care of yourselves. Hmm. I think folks can say goodbye if you want to see. Yeah, you can unmute yourselves or not, or write something in the chat. Feel free to send well wishes to each other. I'll see you next week. Aloha. Mahalo.